I oh, I don't know. I don't know how much they pay them, but I don't think that you can make up with a payment for that. I'm sure they well, pay them yeah, something, but, but yeah, I don't know if I don't know how much they pay them if they pay them. I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure they've given some compensation, but um, I don't know. So let's look at religion now. Uh, the position of the Catholic Church, the major Christian institution as far as numbers is concerned, is one of practical opposition. So in principle, the church allows for the penalty in extreme cases when society finds no other way to defend itself. So for example, if this guy is about to press the, the bottom that's going to make the, the nuclear bomb explode or something, there's no other way but shooting him, that kind of extreme case, um, the, the church will allow for the death penalty. Uh, but in practical terms, the, uh, the last pope, John Paul II, and the, the, the current official position of the Catholic Church is very much against the, the death penalty. And so are other major Christian Protestant institutions, with the exception of the Southern Baptist Convention. As far as the um, Orthodox churches, they don't really talk that much about it. They kind of go with the flow. They don't protest against it, but they do not support it either strongly, so they're not. They're kind of pretty much silent on that issue. Okay, uh, now we move on to the next topic. Unless you have any questions concerning death penalty, yes. Now, when you ask me a question, I'm going to repeat your question for the benefit of the people who will be looking at the videotape or listening to the lecture. So, okay. go ahead. Is the exception of the Southern Baptist, Con Baptist Convention what? I'm sorry? Yeah, you said um, you know, some other major um, Protestant churches. You know, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So they support the death penalty strongly. The Southern Baptist Convention, on, I guess, on Old Testament grounds, support the death penalty strongly. Very strong terms. Yes. Any other question? Yes. So okay. In this. Of the major okay. denominations. Well, any effect on like Northern Baptists? Like uh, well, the other Baptist denominations are more liberal than the Southern Baptists. Yeah. I don't think the other Baptist groups support the death penalty. So, I, I, yeah, I don't want to recap this. The Catholic Church is overall against it, only in extreme cases. The Southern Baptist is for it, and other Christian denominations are generally against it. Yes, yes, yes. The, 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 the Anglican Church, the, the Episcopalian Church is against it, and so are Lutherans and Methodists and, and Presbyterians, and I think most Baptists, but the Southern Baptist Convention is very much for it. Okay? And the Catholic Church, in fact, in principle, allows for it. I mean, the Catholic Church has applied the death penalty very often in its history, in the past. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but today... Pretty much through the personal positioning of the past, the last pope, John Paul II, it's turned very strongly against the death penalty. Any other questions concerning the death penalty? Do you want me to summarize something to clarify, repeat any of the points that I made? Did you understand the difficulty with the deterrence studies? to try to draw conclusion from very sparse data. That's the problem. How, is, how, how in Texas, since they execute so many people, how is that deterrent since they keep executing so many people? I mean, obviously, they're not deterred. Yeah, the yeah, that's it, yeah. It's, they keep executing. Yeah, ex, executions don't seem to have any deterrence effect. I mean, the, you know, you keep having, you keep executing people and the number of murders seem to go up and down depending on other matters. In times of crisis, economic crisis, you can, you can expect a higher murder rate usually uh, depending on social upheavals of different kinds. Um, that's really what seems to move the, the murder 
rates more than people do not calculate that much before killing someone else. They don't just go, okay, well, you know, they don't take a calculator to see their chances of being executed. I don't think it works that way. States that have the death penalty also have higher crimes, I mean, crime rates. That's a, that's a good question. That's a good question. That, that's a good question. Well, let's look, first of all, internationally. The U.S. that has the death penalty has much, much higher murder rates than Europe. But be careful with that because, again, it may have nothing to do with the death penalty. It may have to do with, some, for example, with the fact that you can't buy guns in Europe. If, if you could buy guns, guns freely in Europe, as you can do here, I'm sure the murder rate would go up in Europe as well. Um, the um, percentage of young men in the population, most murders are committed by younger males. It's much higher in the U.S. than in Europe. Okay? And as far as the states within the U.S., I can't really tell you whether Texas has a higher crime rate. It definitely does not have a lower crime rate than the average. It does not. In relation to its population, it has pretty much the same average, uh, the same um, murder rate, and I believe uh, some years it's you know, uh, pretty high. When I looked over it on the DPIC, they said that's what the statistics that they have. That, like, Texas, uh, those states have higher murder rates. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I'd be reluctant to see a correlation in there. I honestly think that may be the case. States with, with, with capital punishment still have higher death murder rates sometimes, but I think it may be a, a matter of chance. It, it's no, it not, may be chance, but doesn't that also mean it's not really deterring? It's not deterring, yeah. If it means something, it is, it's not deterring. Yeah, that's a clear conclusion, if that's the case, yeah. Any other questions? Any other points you'd like to make? Clarifications? Yes, Candice. Um, so you said deterrence was kind of to prevent, not like, so it would keep people from, like the idea that they could die um, for, one or, for, their, for murdering someone would keep them from doing it? That that's what deterrence, that's yeah. What, that's what yeah. Now, we have to make the distinction between deterrence and prevention. Okay. okay? So the Catholic Church says prevention, yes, but there are many ways to prevent murder. We don't need to kill the, if someone kills someone, we can prevent this person from committing other murders by keeping them in prison. We don't need to. No, that's prevention. Prevention doesn't require the death penalty. Deterrence goes past prevention into discouraging others from doing that. Okay? Does it really discourage other people? It's unclear. It doesn't seem like it. So, uh, again, make the distinction between prevention and deterrence, it's two different things. <coughs> Good point, any other questions, any other points you'd like to make? Okay, then we move on to affirmative action. Affirmative action falls under distributive justice, under the category of distributive justice. A response to the concept of restitution. What do we mean by restitution? Restitution. What do we mean by restitution? Restitution is devolution. is to return to someone, to return to its lawful owner what was unfairly, unjustly, or illegally withdrawn, stolen from him or from her. Okay? So the idea is very simple. A group of people were deprived, were unfairly deprived of their equality in past centuries. We're talking about African Americans. And that gave rise to a culture of wealth and privilege among those who profited from that act of stealing. And at the same time, in parallel, it gave rise to a culture of poverty and lack of preparation and lack of skills and, and capacity to compete on the other side, on the side of the victims, 
of that initial act of, of robbery, so to say. How do we compensate for this? Well, by giving now a fair advantage to those who are the victims of that original act of denial of equality. Imagine, let me give you two very simplistic examples. Imagine a bunch of um, teenagers, teenage boys, and, um, and um, one, one of these boys, for some reason, you know, we don't need to get into that, is systematically deprived, systematically um, marginalized, and prevented from um, training with the other boys in the sports or, you know, competing with them. And then one day, whatever we decide, that's unfair. Everyone is equal, and so he should be allowed to train and to play with the other boys and to compete with them. And right after we make that decision, we have a race. So we have all of the boys here who have been training, and this boy who was not allowed to train. Do you think this boy is going to compete in fair conditions with the others? Obviously not, because he wasn't allowed to train before. How do we compensate for this past discrimination that is going to hurt his chances of winning, of competing, by giving him some, say, some early start, for example. So we give him a 30 minute, whatever, 30 second or one or two minute advantage. And with that, we compensate for that lack of preparation, that, which was not due to his fault, but rather to an unfair act of discrimination. There you have it. We have two families, one on each side of the street. They both, both families have more or less the same amount of wealth. But then one of the families, one day, for some reason in this imaginary world of examples, um, attacks the other family, steals everything they have, and with that money, they pay for you know, good schools for their children, and then, of course, their children will get to good positions in society. They will be able to pay their own children for a great education, so that will turn into a, a, a culture of privilege and wealth in the long term, while the family who was the victim of the robbery will not be able to pay for their children's education, and therefore there will be, that situation will perpetuate itself by not being able to pay for their descendants to get a good education and to be able to compete and all that. In the end, you get two cultures, two parallel cultures. That's the principle upon which um, um, affirmative action is, is, is built, one of compensation for past injustices. Now, you may say, <clears throat> well, what about a person who is in, in the 21st century? What do they have with past circumstances? I mean, you know, their parents didn't enslave anyone. And if you're an African-American person, you haven't suffered any such kind of well, that's where the culture part comes into place. Because of, of the person who is enjoying a situation of privilege may not have done anything personally to achieve that situation, but he or she has inherited that situation, even culturally. Say the person just arrived from Germany, and the African-American person just arrived from some other country. They're not, their ancestors were not slaves in this country, and their ancestors were not slave owners. Had nothing to do. But they are suddenly situated as part of a culture that has created a filter, a filter that gives them privilege or denies them certain rights and treats them in a certain way. So there is the, the only way to compensate is well, through um, the uh, affirmative action measures. That's one way to compensate. Um, I know you have a question. Give me one second. Um, Say so through giving them preferential treatment, for example, or through establishing quotas. Now, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, outlawed rigid, the rigid quota system in 1978. Right? So you may choose in between two candidates who are equally or more or less equally qualified for a, for a position, you may choose the minority candidate. But you cannot establish a rigid quota. I'm going to have 15% African-Americans no matter what. And, and you, know, you can't.